couple months or something, right? Yes, it has, man. Yeah. I've been home for over a month with the kids. Yeah, this is a really crazy time. It is. It is, man. But I think uh, it's, uh, it's a new age that we're getting. I believe that. And, uh, you know, before that. it gets better, it has to get worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's like, um, you know, God's just halting everything. You know, he's saying that something's got to change, you know, and, and we're all forced to, to go inward. Exactly. Uh, and reflect on a lot of things that maybe we weren't thinking about uh, enough. Um, and it, you know, comes with a bunch of new challenges, you know, having the kids around, trying to work at home. I mean, you have kids? I have two girls. <laughs> okay. Right on. Cool, man. I know you have a little boy, right? I have four boys. What? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. God, what? <laughs> but you see how old I am, bro? No, man. You look young. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> well, the, you know, the beard makes me look very old. It's funny. I mean, everyone, since I had the beard, everyone thinks I'm old now. And I, I guess I am. I'm, I'm like 47, something no, like that. No, you're not old, man. <laughs> I know, I'm not old. But if I shave my beard, I actually look like a young kid. It's funny. Um, but I noticed when I, um, you know, grew, grew my beard, like I'd go to Starbucks and and people would call me sir more often, like especially young people would call <laughs> you, me sir. Seems like you like that. <laughs> called me sir before. Now I got this. I'm sir. You know, it's funny, man. Yeah. Uh, we call you a rabbi behind the scenes. So <laughs> yeah, that's what people are saying. It's funny. Um, even though I know very little, I mean, about Judaism, um, I'm I'm not a, a practicing Jew. I mean, I always have issues with the the term practicing when people say, "Oh, are you a practicing this or are you a practicing that." And people generally think that, oh, practicing means doing this particular rituals associated with a religion, right? So practicing Muslim would mean you're doing your, your, your five times a day prayer, uh, you're doing Ramadan, you're fasting, that's practicing. But what about, I mean, because that's actually a small percentage of your day, right? Even if you're a Muslim, five times a day, it's still a small percentage of your day. What about the 95% of the rest of your day? Aren't you practicing too, in a sense, right? That's Aren't true. you being a good person? Aren't you trying to give uplift people in the world? And that's what's Are you trying important. to work on your imperfections. That's all practicing. That's very yeah. true. Yeah. Well, God bless you. I wish we had more people like you. <laughs> so, I see so your background. We got the same backgrounds. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> some some idols and stuff back there. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool, man. Yeah. I got I like those in uh, Cairo. All right, nice. Um, I got a few of mine from Cairo and the rest from Lebanon. Cool, man. Right on. So, uh, so bro, Hamza Awad. Great. Yes, um, so are you, you're originally from Lebanon? I am originally from Lebanon, but born and raised in Kinshasa, Zaire, which is known oh. by the Congo today. Ah, that's probably why we connect so well, too. You know, I spent a lot of time in Africa. I did not know that. Where? Uh, so I lived in West Africa and a few different countries uh, for 12 years. Awesome. Um, I'm actually recently returned to the U.S. like three years ago. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I lived in. I, I spent eight years in uh, Bamako in Mali. Um, I spent almost four years in Senegal, living and working, and then uh, almost a year in Cameroon. I'm sure um, you're still very attached to Africa. Because oh yeah, I mean, yeah, you know how it is. Uh, um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of freedom in, in, in uh, undeveloped countries. I mean, because they just don't have as many laws in place and regulations That's yet. True. So I always remembered, you know, every time I'd get off the airplane to, to come back to Africa, I'd always, and, and I'd get in a taxi, I always feel this relief, like, ah, I'm free. <laughs> now I'm, I'm good. <laughs> fun. You know, I'm home, I'm relaxed, everyone's normal again. You know, um, I like it a lot. So yeah, yeah, I miss it. I miss it a lot. I love it. Do you speak any of the dialects? Yeah, well, I speak uh, Bamana. I speak the language from Mali. So, awesome. I lived there so long, and I, I was actually interested in the culture. Um, I was studying drumming, uh, djembe, um, traditional djembe drumming. And so uh, I was pretty integrated with the locals. I lived in a local poor neighborhood uh, for years. Um, so you have African blood, man. Kind of. Yeah, my wife's also from West Africa. All right, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot for coming on the show. So this is it. This is my, the show. You see how easy it is? That's that's awesome, man. And thank you so yeah. much for all your efforts, man. We need, truly, we need more people like you. I know that a lot of people are initiating new things like Joe Martinez. That's right. Uh, but I remember when you started yours, it was brand new. Nobody has done, had done anything. So yeah. God bless yeah. you. Keep 
Yeah, yeah I kind of, <laughs> I was there a little bit before the, the wave began, you know, right. it was just serendipity. I mean, it was just timing. I mean, I didn't know COVID was coming. And we started doing those watch parties. And I mean, we had already started Esoteric Sundays, you know, like a little more than half a year ago in my lodge in Ashburn Sterling in Ashburn, Virginia, um, because a lot of the brothers wanted more esoteric, you know, information and wanted an That's opportunity great. to get together. Those of us who were interested in esoteric or the deeper meaning of masonry, the wisdom that's supposedly there. Um, we wanted that. So we made it happen, you know, and uh, we started doing presentations uh, once a month on Sundays. And then, you know, I made that, that Facebook page, Esoteric Sundays, and uh, decided, well, when we're not doing presentations in the actual lodge, maybe uh, other Sundays we can do watch parties. So I started putting together kind of cool documentaries I saw online and, you know, hosting watch parties. And, and last Sunday, I, I didn't do that because there's just so much now. That's right. Because of COVID, I'm just like, well, I'm going to back <laughs> off because, you know, it's, it's it a special. lot of good stuff. And I can't, I don't even, I want to watch it too. I don't want to be making a watch party. I want to watch some of this stuff that's coming out. So, um, so I'm kind of focusing a little bit on this Just Masons because it's a little easier. And I think we need that. We need brothers knowing each other, you know, getting yeah. introduced to different uh, kinds, it. different brethren. Yeah, thanks, bro. I appreciate your support. Um, so, uh, yeah, we had some kind of rough guidelines here, some questions to possibly discuss. Um, so yeah, I guess you know it'd be really interesting to hear how you first got interested or introduced to masonry. What's your what's your backstory there? So honestly, uh, it goes back in, since I was four years old. I used to go to summers in Lebanon, and my mm -hmm. uncle had this huge mansion in the Bekaa Valley in Baalbek, mm -hmm. right next to the Roman ruins. Wow. And every time I used to go there for summers, I was astonished seeing all these people going in and out, you know, presidents, prime ministers from all over the world going in in secrecy. Right. As all this down, I too, and he had this labyrinth in his uh, backyard that led to a pyramid made of woods, completely of wood, no nails, no metals. And I used to go play there as pharaohs and priests, you know. And then it turns out that he was the grandmaster of the Grand Orient in the Middle, Middle East. So oh, wow. He, and before that, and they all followed uh, the Grand Orient. Uh, so when I found out, you know, 2007, I asked and doors were open to me in Lebanon. Uh, but I didn't know that there was the whole thing about the Grand Orient in the United States and you mm -hmm. know, the Grand Lodge of England. Right. So I came to the United States back in 2007 uh, and I, uh, I was watching TV. And then my, call, my wife called me and told me she's watching the History Channel. There's this guy called Akram Elias, and his name sounds Lebanese. And he's uh, soon to be Grandmaster of DC. So, you know, I wanted to go back to Lebanon and see my wife. So I went back for a year and then came back to the States and then just picked up the phone, called Akram's office, who is the past Grandmaster of DC in 2008. I have, took a meeting, went to his office, opened the door, and he's like, Do I know you? And uh, like you don't know you you don't know me, but uh, consider yourself as a shepherd, and I'm the sheep. So wherever you go, I'm going. <laughs> uh, I explained to him uh, how I started and everything, and he told me just wait. I went back to Qatar. You know, I worked there. Went to Denmark. Went back to Lebanon. Got married to my wife. Came back to the states, and then going uh, to lodges around D.C. And I found Benjamin B. French, which I know you're familiar with. That's right. Uh, hey brother, brother, uh, your your sound, your audio is kind of going in and out a little bit. I don't know if it's uh, all right. It almost sounds like a connection issue, but maybe it's not. All right. Do I sound better now? Well, you sound good for the moment, but you, sometimes you know you'll be talking, and then sometimes your your volume uh, goes kind of out. Really, like it almost sounds like a connectivity issue. You don't have any connectivity issues normally. I, I don't actually. Yeah. I'm, because, but it just let me know if it happens again. All right, I'll let you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I went yeah. to BBF. I demitted from Lebanon, although I did all my three degrees there, and I joined BBF, and that was the office line. So, wow. Yeah, wow. You know, BBF is astonishing. You know, the people there, uh, 
especially how they go into the esoteric a lot more than other lodges, which was uh, kind of shocking to me when I came to the States that they're not as esoteric as Europe and the rest of the world. And I heard it's because of after World War II, you know, uh, they wanted to bring members back. And it seems like they went more into the Christian side and to the social side than the esoteric side. Right. Interesting. Yeah, because um, maybe during maybe during that period there wasn't that much interest in, in the esoteric. So if you wanted a membership, you had to have an, another angle. Exactly. For appeal, perhaps. That's right. And you know, people yeah. when all these men went to war and came back, they were like, you know, more attached to their religions. And come back to God and they have senses, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we diverted from the true path of what masonry truly represents. Mm. Yeah. So, so in, in Lebanon, um, how is masonry viewed? Like, for example, I know in Africa, you know, a lot of people have these conspiracy, even, even in the U.S., they have a lot of conspiracy theories or they think they're evil or they worship the devil or are they the ones controlling all the politics or all the presidents are in it so it can't be good because our presidents are corrupt. You know the whole deal. Yeah, we definitely, <laughs> we definitely have that in Lebanon. Yeah. What's better in Lebanon than the rest of the Middle East is that in Lebanon, you know, Lebanon is the only country that has a Christian president in the entire Middle East. Uh, we have about 19 sects and religions in a 10,000 kilometer square. So, and we have all kinds of cultures, you know, from the Kurds, the Armenians, the Arabs, all these people gathered together. It's like this melting pot of cultures and religions. And mm. that allowed Lebanese, the Lebanese population to be a little more educated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that help that helps a lot. But there is, of course, all these conspiracies. However, you know, knowing that Lebanon, this is where Tyre, uh, where King Hiram comes from. That's right. Uh, so it's kind of the history in Lebanon. It's exciting. So a little more open into masonry, but you still yeah. have these parts in Lebanon where they, you know, consider you a satanic or, a, a, you know, a Zionist just because of the sign. Right, right. Yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, and there's a lot of um, YouTube videos and stuff on, on the internet now, sort of anti-Masonic stuff that's spreading a lot of this, um, you know, nonsense, really. Uh, for those of us who are in Freemasonry, we know, we know what it's truly about. Um, it's a wisdom tradition. It's, it's, it's like, you know, without any ties to any specific religion, you know, we don't worry about the details of religion. People can worship whatever God or faith they want. If you're a Christian, you're welcome. If you're a Muslim, you're welcome. Hindu, no problem. You know, just believe in God. We're not going to discuss dogma and religion with you. That's your personal business. That's but we are going to discuss how to become a better person. Exactly. You know, how to become a better man and, and, do, and, and improve yourself and to do good in this world. Um, and to spread sort of peace and love. And and that's not what we're hearing online in a lot of these like videos and stuff about masonry, unfortunately. So it, it's good that you know people like us come out and you know do like a little recording like this, so people can see. Hello, this is what exactly. an Mason looks like, and I look a little weirder than most. <laughs> <You know? laughs> don't, don't don't think I'm like all Freemasons. Uh, definitely, uh, I mean, I look more normal. I guess when I take this off, I can also shave. And, and and not, you look you you look good too. You don't worry, no matter what you do. <laughs> I like you know, the hat, you know, I, I like the hat. You know, I, uh, I consider myself an omnius, so it's interesting that yeah. you say that. And uh, yeah. I gave my obligation in the three holy books, so I started with the Torah and then the Bible. Yes. I was interesting. Raised, I was yeah. raised as a Catholic uh, mm, when I was yeah. born, baptized, although my parents are Shia Muslim, and I learned Arabic from the Quran in Lebanon. And then started going into the Kabbalah from a Hacham, which was a close friend of my dad. And, I, you know, I came here and find you guys, which was... Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you have Adam Goldman, brother Adam Goldman, too. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You pick his brain a lot? I do, I do. <laughs> he, he calls me Lucifer. <laughs> Although we know who's the right, who's the true Lucifer. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, now that's that's going to drive the internet mad now that you said that. You know? Yes, I know that. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, I only have like 47 views, so no worries. Uh, all right, <laughs> well, I think with the things that we're going to go into right now, <laughs> things are going to get a lot worse. <laughs> a little viralized. <laughs> Even more than the coronavirus? Ah, uh, tell me about it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You know, the word quarantine actually can't, comes from Arabic. It means oh. arba'in, uh, the fourth.
volunteer. Uh, he found out about the plagues and things like that, and uh, his theory was to keep people. Wait, say in that. Their... Sorry, brother. Say that again. You, your your video just stopped for one second, and I, I missed what you said after the quarantine is Arabic. Yes. So there's this guy called Ibn Sina. Uh -huh. He's a Sufi scholar. I think he was in the 11th century or something like that. And uh, they had a little plague somewhere in Syria, in Damascus. And uh, he thought of keeping people in their houses for 40 days and to get rid of that plague. And it worked. Oh, wow. And the uh, word spread around the world, the world, and it went to Italy, and they called it quarantine, quarantina, which is 40, like 40 days. Wow. And that's wow. where quarantine comes from. Wow. Interesting. Um, also, it's Passover. Passover started yesterday. Um, I've never celebrated it, uh, but I was going to try yesterday, but then I realized how complicated it was. And it was like, nah, I can't, I can't do this alone. You know, I might be able to have a nice dinner and do some prayers with my family, but that's about it. Um, but uh, it's interesting that it's Passover and the whole idea of Passover in the Bible is that there was a, there was all these plagues, you know, that's coming great. from God. And the, the only thing that could protect them was during Passover, you know, the Jews painted the, uh, the lamb's blood Ooh, the over red the doors yeah. and the sign. And uh, to show that, you know, they were, you know, followers of God or, you know, some would say even that they're, they're connected to the constellation of Aries, right? That's the right. Of course. Yes. With, uh, that the procession had moved. Exactly. You know, uh, they were the ones in the know, so to speak. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, it's just very interesting symbolically that we're going through a plague and uh, it's Passover right now. It's uh, shit's, shit's crazy, man. And think about Aquarius <laughs> coming in sight. So, uh, yeah, it explains a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so what, what, what I guess what you know it would be interesting to, to know, and, you, and I guess you mentioned some of this is uh, how you see Freemasonry different in America. I mean, you mentioned that you 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 thought it would be more esoteric, but then it wasn't. But then you found Benjamin B. French Lodge, right? Yes. And they are kind yes. of esoteric, but not as esoteric as I saw in Lebanon. Uh, just to be honest. Wow. So the ritual is the ancient Scottish rites, and like, and it's very heavy in symbolism, uh, especially wow. in their uh, in the first three degrees. A lot of symbolism, and the nice thing about it in Lebanon is that if you want to go from one degree to another, you have to wait a year, and the first year should be in silence, and you cannot talk or say any word inside the lodge room, which wow. is very interesting. It goes back to the Pythagorean years, you know. Pythagoras, oh. you know, they stayed all these years, they, these That's three right. first years to get initiated into the first degree, which was the only degree back then. That's right, right. Yeah. Wow. Which so, is, uh, yeah. And, and, and so you have a lot of brothers that are knowledgeable there too about esoteric stuff? Uh, yes. Uh, I stopped talking to most of them since I came to the States. I got involved here, but I still have contacts with them. Especially after uh, two or maybe three new uh, lodges uh, that, are, that were chartered. Uh, by the District of Columbia in, in Lebanon. Uh, okay. So that, that brought a little more hope for people there that are Masons to be able to be recognized around the world and not only a few specific countries. I see, I see. Yeah, and you know, some people might get the wrong, you know, wrong uh, idea when we use the term esoteric. Even some Masons, I think it rubs them wrong because it makes it sound like some kind of elitist thing, like, oh, we're the only ones that really know Masonry or something. And, and I don't want to give that impression because I think that's also not, not good. That's um, true. You know, and, and, and esoteric, you know, means uh, so, sort of strange or hidden, um, uh, a little bit outside the norm of understanding, I guess. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of the wisdom around the symbolism we use in Freemasonry and uh, around the meaning that's truly trying to be conveyed through our ritual has been lost. Over exactly. time, and thus we call that esoteric now. Unfortunately, that's you know right. I mean? Because it's that's not right. On the front anymore. It's not real clear. And I think a lot of our, um, our our rituals and stuff have also degraded a bit over time. Um, they've uh, become more. Um, what's the word? Not mundane, but I uh, was going to say mundane, but then yeah, I kind thought of more mundane or more. You know, they've been made. Uh, they've been mainstreamed in a way. And, and, and some of the deeper aspects have been re removed and, and, and it's more of a practical approach has been added. Um, like I was talking on uh, one show by uh, Brother Taylor or something, 
The other night he did a really good presentation on um, the lost word or the word in masonry and the temple. And, you know, I was telling him that, you know, in, in Pike's Esoterica, um, there, there's a, a part in the catechism where he asked why, you, you know, he became a master mason. Um, and and, and we, we know, you know, the whole deal about widows and orphans and blah, blah, blah. Apparently that came later. That's right. and, and the first thing that was said is in search of the word, the lost word. And that got removed. I know in Virginia ritual, we don't have that in the response anymore. And I'm like, God, what is going on? Why would you remove something so critical? You know? And he was also, interestingly, he was talking about the lost word. Um, and this was the first time I heard it expressed this way as uh, we all want to find the lost word, which he was saying was certainty. Certainty about things, like a, a sense of certainty. And, and, and you know, um, you sort of that divine knowledge or that connection to truth, yeah. right? That's certainty in a way. That's right. And he was saying that the substitute word is faith. So until you have certainty, you have faith. I thought, wow, that was really interesting. It was an interesting perspective. It's you know? very interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, talking about certainty, I did uh, in Gematria, you know, when you turn the letters into numbers, into the yeah. addition, I found three words uh, from all the words that I've done, which were about 200 words that came up. I did the percentages for each of these words and three words came as 100%. Not love, not peace. It was uh, intention perspective, certainty. These were the three, only three words that I came up with that had a hundred percent. All the other words came up wow. at 98, 90, you know, love, right. hate, and everything else. But these three, how did you think you had the right pr perspective, good right. intention, and in search of certainty, you will wow. find maybe that lost word. And, and you analyze the gematria of, of all words or what not all I, I, I did about 200 words uh, okay, I did the right, word that yeah. you know the, the more uh, general yeah, words yeah. like love peace hate uh, you know I did the Quran Bible Torah and all these words came up with that's the 90s 80s 70s but none of them came up as a hundred that's interesting it, it sort of reminds me of the um, those scientific experiments or quasi scientific I guess experiments where um, they would uh, think certain thoughts or say certain words, like, you know, think love over water or something. That's, and then yeah. they would show the formations would be more symmetrical when they were That's like positive right. thoughts. And when someone was thinking things like greed or hate or whatever, it would the be this vibes and the way disjointed structure in the water crystals. You know what I'm talking That's about? Right. I do know what you're talking about. I think it's a Japanese uh, yes. doctor Japanese, who did that. Uh, That's right. I, I have this book. <laughs> I, I, you know, actually in Islam, what's interesting is that when they want to do amulets or I don't want to say spells, but, you know, good, good fortune. Uh, they, they, yes. So they, they speak into water and they put writings from the Quran inside the water and you drink that water. That's right. And you That's have to right. keep it for 24 hours at least from one night to the other. That's right. Responding to the moon, where the water can contain all the spell and the words and the emotions that you put into, that you can take within you. And you know, with all the signs that came through today with the Japanese doctor and everything, it's funny that uh, ancient cultures do a lot more than we think they did. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and in fact, you know, when I was in um, Mali, when I was living in Mali, West Africa, um, I got into uh, traditional medicine uh, from, from Mali. And wow. I was already, I studied Ayurveda and Chinese medicine uh, some years back. And I've always had an interest in natural medicine. And so when I went to Mali, I'm like, well, let me, let me study the African herbs, you know? And um, they, they've got a lot of powerful stuff. They use a lot of trees and barks and stuff and leaves from trees. Whereas, you know, we think of herbalism as little shrubs and plants, but they add trees to the mix. You know, they're using a lot of trees, yeah. powerful trees. Wow. And so, um, I got into that. And one of the things that I, I learned there is that they still have that kind of tradition that you're talking about where, you know, some of these softer aspects of medicine are also important. It's not just about the chemical elements, right? And so, um, for example, like when they have to cut from certain trees, they have to do it at a certain point in the, where the moon is in a certain stage, a certain day wow. of the week, a certain time in the morning or at night. Sometimes they have to go, they have to take off their clothes before they, they have to be naked at middle of the night to take off the medicine from the plant. They have to circle the tree a few times. They have to go northeast, west, south. They have to do different things or else the medicine won't work. 
Wow. All right. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. You know, thinking about it, it's the same, you know, when we do, they do the placebo pill, you know, they make you think that yes. that's going to make you better. And then yeah. all of a sudden you and truly it believe yeah. it because yeah. we have that power within us. That's you know, true. you can get high without smoking weed. You can reach any state of mental consciousness. That's true. That's true. And, and, and even like the whole idea of, you know, cooking with love. You know, yes. when people say, oh, her food's so good. You know, grandma's food's so good yeah, because exactly. she made it with love. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and I, I think that's true, too. I mean, I, I notice I like to cook. Um, and I notice when I'm really rushed or stressed or if I'm angry while I'm cooking or arguing or something, the food's not going to be as good. It's just that's not going to be as good. But if I'm able to take my time, relax, put some music on, maybe have a cup of wine, take, you know, I've got the time to do it right. I cut all my vegetables. I get everything organized and prepped, you know, ready nice. to go. And I savor every aspect of the cooking process. And I want to do it perfect, like an alchemist, <laughs> and you know. Nice. And I'm putting love in, and sometimes even like praying while you make the food that and, this food will be nourishing, and everyone will love it, and it will be bring, bring blessings and stuff. I feel like that has a, a profound effect. It, it does. It does. <laughs> uh, in in Arabic, they say uh, when the food is good, they say fi hanafis. Mm. There's breath in it. Uh, uh, nafis, not only breath, means also soul, breath and soul inside the food, uh, which is, uh, yeah, adds a lot to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it also especially works with um, uh, medicine, like um, uh, herbal medicine that you're creating uh, to heal a sickness. It's good to do prayers and to make it with intention and, and, and to, in a respectful process in as traditional a manner as possible. And I think that that makes the efficacy of the, the, the medicine more potent. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's powerful, but this is the kind of stuff that people would say, oh, that doesn't matter. What is that? That's fake, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, um, what can I Which say? is unfortunate, yeah. which is very unfortunate. You know, you yeah. were saying about when you were in Mali, how they used to take off their clothes and circle around trees. Uh, you know, this is an old uh, cultural thing that started in Arabia, uh -huh. actually in uh, pre-Islamic uh, religions, the pagan religions. Uh, Mecca was a shrine to Al Kaaba, which was a goddess. Al Kaaba means the cube, but That's it right. also it also means your heel, and heel. You know, in Arabic, just like in Hebrew, Semitic languages, you know, some nouns are feminine or masculine, mm. and Al Kaaba is feminine. And it was the goddess Al Kaaba, and her sh her statue was made of acacia acacia tree, which was very sacred for her. And there was a, a lot of acacia bushes around Al Kaaba, which were sacred for the goddess Al Kaaba. Now, when they used to circum circumambulate at the Kaaba, circumambulate, circumambulate. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, turn around the Kaaba. They used to do it the same way they do it today, but they used to be naked. And men used to do it in daytime right. and women in night. Uh, and the only reason for women in night is because uh, the goddess of the moon uh, was a female. And mm. a female represented the, the other side of energy. So positive, negative, electromagnetic. And it was the magnetic energy for women and the uh, electro, uh, electric uh, energy for, for, uh, for male, wow. which is also interesting. Mm -hmm. And also talking about that since, you know, yeah. I've been tr trying to do write a paper about pre-Islamic religion, and I started with Lilith, and then you know going back up to uh, to uh, the recent uh, Islam uh, religion. Yeah. And it's interesting that although in Islam people think of women as you know uh, second degree or anything, it didn't start like that. Uh, women were venerated in Islam, and if you look at just as yeah. I mentioned, Kaaba is a female; she was a goddess. Uh, also, uh, if you look at the black stone in Kaaba, which is on the east side, on the east corner of the Kaaba, there's the black stone, Al-Hajar Al-Aswad. Yeah. Some, some people say uh, it's an asteroid that fell or a volcanic right. rock. Right. It's black, reddish black, and it was yeah. broken to several pieces. They were bounded together in a silver thread. Now, if you Google that, it looks like a yoni. Yeah, I did Google it. I, it does look like a yoni. Yeah. And people actually touch it to uh, yeah. to go back to the essence of God, which is the Adam Kadamon, the perfect man. Right. And which is interesting. And to add to that, you know, if you go to the Kaaba, 
is situated in the northeast. And as Masons, we know what that. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Uh, very, very interesting. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Ayat al Shaitaniya, the Satanic Verses. I've heard of it. I, I had that book given to me when I was in high school by my mom's boyfriend, but I never read Have it. Have you read it? I was too, and I didn't read it. I was too dumb. It's, you should read it. It's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I don't know why. They, Salman Rushdie, right? I'm sorry? Salman Rushdie? Yes, Salman yeah. Rushdie, that's right. So uh, in Islam, when Muhammad was getting the messages uh, from God, he received at one point three verses that were talking about the daughters of Allah, Alat, Manat, and al uh, Uzza. So these three daughters were the main uh, d demigods under Allah, which Allah in Arabic means the God, the Almighty. Mm. And uh, all these other sub-gods were actually reflection of the all-supreme God. That's pre-Islamic. Now, when Muhammad came, you know, he united God in the one God, which was already known there. You know, Muhammad's father, his name is Abdullah, which is the slave of Allah. So yeah. Allah actually existed before Islam, before Muhammad. That's right. So now when he received the three verses, he was talking about the three daughters of Allah. The only reason is he wanted to get the tribes that were still pagans into Islam. And he thought that this way he will attract them by giving a message. Now, when the verses came down, a lot of the Muslim, uh, a lot of the prophets of friends came to him and said, you know, this is against the true message of Allah. And since there's only one supreme deity, no God can exist. And he couldn't explain to them that these are aspects of God right. in, in a way. So the next day he woke up and he said that Gabriel came to him and told him to remove these verses. But these verses will stay as the a secret opening of the gates of heaven. Now, this is only mentioned in the Ahadith, which are the stories of the prophets, not in the Quran. Uh, which is also interesting uh, that uh, Muhammad said that uh, the gates of heaven are open under the feet of mothers and when you say mother in uh, in ancient time it's uh, mother earth uh, the mother uh, the the black stone which is also called the uh, the old woman and now the only reason they call the black stone the old woman is uh, Jumping from one thing to another, but it's very well, that's exciting. That's masonry. You jump from one thing to another. <laughs> exactly. It's all about these connections, man. Exactly. Sometimes they're quite remote, but shocking. There's a connection, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the black stone is called the, uh, the, old, uh, the old woman. There's a story uh -huh. that says that when Abraham was purchasing the land where the Kaaba, where he was constructing the Kaaba, uh, he wanted to buy it from this old woman that had gray hair. Uh, and he asked her to buy it. And she said on one condition that you leave the key of the door of the Kaaba with me and my descendants. Interesting enough, today the tribe that's, uh, that keeps the key of Kaaba is called uh, 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 Bani Sheba, the sons of the old lady. Sons of the old lady. Interesting. So it goes back to in the Abrahamic times where, uh, where, where. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot there. Um, a couple things that I would uh, point out in what you were saying is, first of all, going back to the Kaaba being a cube, right? And, and then having a, a female stone of dark black stone inside that's sort of the feminine aspect. It reminds me of the, uh, in the Jewish tradition, the, the Shekinah or the Shekinah, uh, which is female uh, inside the world of matter, right? Because the cube often represents matter. And so who, who are you touching in the Kaaba? You're trying to get in touch with your own Sophia. Exactly. Yourself, that divine spark inside exactly. of you. Exactly. That, that Ein you Sophia, see. yes. That, you know, is lost to you. You got to find it. And, um, yeah, and, and also, the, you know, just the, the fact that the women are the keepers or the female keepers of this tradition. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this whole feminine aspect and, you know, whether it's in Gnosticism, whether it's Sophia, um, you know, and, 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 and it's interesting how it's often described in Gnosticism, uh, and I've said this on another show too, and I'm not a dualist or anything, um, but I'm just explaining the Gnostic point of view that uh, Sophia is sometimes seen as a prostitute. 
That's right. And that confuses some people. Like, how could you call something so divine as your inner spark of divinity a prostitute? You know, and, and, and the reason being is that because metaphorically, in a sense, she's been separated from her husband in heaven above. That's right. right? And, and she's, in a way, whoring herself in this material world, being, you know, kind of scraped through this life, which is not so pleasant all the time and not so perfect, like perhaps heaven above with her husband, her father in heaven, the father. In heaven. That's right. The male aspect that she wants to be reunited. She wants to be reunited, reattached. So that's why I she's do, prostituting right? herself to yeah. go through that. Path. Exactly. exactly. And, it, it, and I also think there's a connection maybe with the horror of Babylon concept. You know, who's the whore of Babylon? You know, that, that could be the Sophia again. Exactly. You know, and was, Mary Magdalene. And, yes, exactly. Uh, um, and so, even Isis um, at one point was yeah. called the whore. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, and, uh, you know, it also makes me think of, uh, you know, truth itself, you know. And, I mean, where at the end of the day do we find truth? I mean, we you can look at books, you can listen to people, but you're always um comparing it to something to make a decision on whether you want to believe it or not right well you know some people say well no i'm i'm uh let's say i'm i'm christian because it says in the and i believe these things because the bible says that that that's true and, and i would say to them but how did you come to that determination that you believe in the bible you came to that determination exactly. you decided that so you read it something you liked about it and you said that's it that's the truth so that means that you're you're already comparing to truth that you know internally. So you have right. some conception of truth inside yourself, and you're looking in the world for some confirmation. That's that universal universal vibe that's in yeah. us. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. So um, that's why you know I, I as I get older I learn to trust myself more and more. Uh, and if something doesn't rub me right or doesn't make sense when I read it, I'm not going to just believe it because. A lot it of the other nice parts order. of the book make sense, you know. That's right. I'm going to take what's good and the stuff that doesn't jive with me, I leave that behind. Mm -hmm. I don't have to swallow the horse pill. That's you exactly know, how no I to take it all and believe everything in, in one volume or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. I call myself an omniist. I find truth in all I am too. Yeah. I am too, actually. I like that. I'm an omniist too, um, and I, I study all the faiths. And, and I can find wisdom in, in, in everything. I mean, you can find wisdom in every, everything in life, you know, That's every right. moment you live in. Um, you know, I think what did, you know, Jesus say in the Bible, you know, it's something you should ask little children about the, the secret of life, or I don't know if it's a Gnostic gospel or something like that. I think it is Gnostic um, gospel, yeah. yes. But we should be able to find truth even in a child's, you know, expressions or whatever. That's right. Um, and, I, and I really believe that. Uh, you know, um, in a precipice, a human beings always find the right path. You know, when mm. they put in that situation where they have to make a decision of life and death, and and only that that thing that you're talking about, believing in their instinct and feel, you know, feeling the feelings that they're feeling, right. and and acting upon it. Right. That's where knowledge comes. And from my experience, I found that the best way to find truth, or it's not the easiest way, but through suffering. Yeah. And if you look at all these prophets and all the messengers, they, the only way they received the, the, the message was through their suffering. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, Very true. I mean, you know, um, many people say, well, if God is so good, then why is there suffering in the world? And I would say that's exactly why he's so good. Exactly. exactly. You know, because he loves us so much, he puts us through hell. Exactly. You know, because he wants that growth. He knows that's what we want, too. We want to grow. Exactly. We want to be free. We want our souls to have more wisdom and knowledge. And the way to get there is to overcome obstacles. And, you know? and how do stars, when do stars shine the most in the darkest times? That's right. Yes. Darkness yeah. does not exist. There's only the absence of that light. Hate does not exist. There's only the absence of love. So goodness and positiveness is all around. It's all there is. There's nothing right. else. Right. So, so in your research uh, that you're working on, you're working on this paper. Um, I also had a, a little bit of an interest in Lilith. For, for a small period um, a few years back, but I didn't really go down that rabbit hole too far. Um, do you, so who is Lilith anyway? I mean, for you, what's the basic understanding of Lilith? So Lilith, the, the, oldest, uh, the oldest, you know, saying about Lilith that I found was uh, in Gilgamesh or a, in the Sumerian, um, uh, even before the Sumerian and the Babylonians as well. But when, 
uh, Lilith became uh, demonized was the first time was back in the 1800s BC. And oh, we kept wow. seeing it throughout. And she actually was demonized in believed in her first. And uh, they demonized her because uh, they didn't truly understand what it truly means. And today, thankfully, with the Kabbalah, it's good to truly see the essence of where Lilith came upon. And that's the oh. reason where I went into Islam and talking about the deities in Islam, uh -huh. and especially the feminine aspect. And it's right. interesting that you spoke about the Shekinah, the female aspect. Right. Now, uh, although it originated back and you can find it in Gilgamesh and Babylonian scriptures, uh, in the Judaism, it's only mentioned in the Talmud and in the alpha, alphabet of Ben Sira, which was, I think, in uh, 700 to 1000 after Christ. Uh, and what is said about her, so I'm sure everybody knows the story by now, but when God created Adam, which is Adam Kadamon, the perfect man, which is male, female in one, in right. one body, yeah. uh, he created Lilith with Adam Kadamon. So Lilith right. is the opposite of the two, of the female and male. I see, I see. They were created from the same essence. Now, they had, uh, they had kind of a conflict when they were sleeping together. Uh, Adam wanted to be on the top. He wanted her to be submissive. And she was saying that, you know, we're created equal. Why aren't I supposed to be on top? And, you know, this whole thing started. Yeah. And then... Uh, this program is not for children, folks. <laughs> yes, yes, not at all. <laughs> So uh, Adam got uh, very pissed off. He tried to force Lilith into submission. So Lilith all of a sudden uh, invoked God's name, which was unknown to anyone. And uh, as you know, uh, only a few prophets know, knew the God's name, which were Moses and I believe Abraham. And uh, uh, wow. Adam at that time did not know his name. So wow. she flew into the air. And uh, and uh, went uh, to uh, and uh, went to God and told God that you know we are created equal. Why aren't I supposed to be on top, or at yeah. least give me a chance? And, and this is sorry, this is pre Eve, right? This is the, yeah, this is pre Eve. Eve was, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Eve was not Relatively created. unknown to most people. Yes. Uh, so uh, she left and, and she went to the Red Sea. And she settled there. And it's interesting that she went to the Red Sea because this is where the Pharaoh's army were sunk in, in the right, Red Sea. Yeah. And she found like a little demons that she put together and she actually gave birth to her first child. I think his name is Lilim uh, in the Red Sea. Now Adam went to God and told him, well, uh, that didn't work and uh, I need a partner. Uh, what should we do? So he sent three angels to go search for the village. And these three angels went down and they found Lilith in the Red Sea and they told her, come back to Adam uh, or else we'll drown you. And she said, but how can you drown me if God gave me an order to take all the firstborn that aren't, that aren't circumcised? And I'm supposed to guard male children until eight days and females until 20 days. Now the angels were astonished that they didn't know that God gave her an order. And they're like, and... Then she said, how would you kill me if uh, God gave me that order and I know his name? So they went back to God and they told him and God cursed her by killing a hundred of her offsprings every day. Now being, uh, being who she is, she used to get more than a hundred child every day from these uh, demons in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Now... Adam, you know, he named all the animals and he actually, he was searching for that partner. And it is said in the Bensina, in the alphabet, uh, what's it called, Bensira, uh -huh. that Adam actually had uh, uh, intercourse with animals. And that's why some animals have torsos that look like human beings. Oh, wow. But he never that's found that. A little side yes. story there. <laughs> God. Adam's a wild one. Yeah, very wild. <laughs> but but I'll, 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 I'll translate yeah. or explain it in a different sense in a little uh -huh. bit. So he went to God and God says, well, the only way that I can do that is to bring your partner from you. So they say that now rib, it's misunderstood. It's not rib, it's side. It's the Hebrew translation. I'm not oh. sure of the word. It doesn't mean rib, but the true translation means side. Oh, so, so from, he, from his side. 
Yes. And like there's two sides. Exactly. Interesting. And, and the side, the other side is the exact opposite of the male side, which is the female side. The other polarity. He divided Adam and brought Eve from Adam. And this is uh, in a similar aspect. This is the division of a cell in the ether, in heaven, in Eden, before right. going down to earth. Now, wow, wow, wow. When, when this happened, uh, they lived together in Eden. And then uh, Lilith was very envious and angry. And she became the succubus that we know today. And uh, she decided to kill all the firstborn children of Adam and Eve. Now, what's interesting is that here comes Samael, the angel Samael. Right. Which is, uh, Samael, I believe it means uh, to accomplish the order of God. Because every word that has il, it has the name of God in it. So okay. he, he is commanded by God. So Samael is an angel. Uh, he right. only takes orders from God. So Samael came and Lilith took the form of a, of a serpent. Now, a serpent in ancient cultures was always the mother. She was always the start of everything. If you go into like the caves of prehistoric man, there's always a snake somewhere. That that's right. And the goddess. And that's why the snake was uh, demonized at the end. And the connection of the earth. Exactly. Crawling on the earth. Right? Crawling on the earth. Exactly. And the mother earth. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Lilith then turned into a serpent and she was commanded and uh, she was controlled by now, in a few places in the Talmud, it says that Samael rode the serpent and through his, uh, I don't remember how he said it, but through his filth on, onto uh, Eve. Now, throwing filth means sperm. Right, right. Yeah. So it can, be, it can be perceived as disgusting. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he threw, yeah. he threw his filth on, on right. his filth came from both Eve, uh, from Lilith, and himself so partly angel and another part which is uh the uh, a sense of adam kadamon the perfect man right, which is the right. opposite yes the female side of adam so this is where uh cain came along the first uh -huh. child and as we know cain wait wait cain 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 oh so so in this story cain came from samael uh mating with lilith yes because I've heard the one where Cain came from Samael mating with Eve. I've heard that version in the Rosicrucian. It's temple. actually it's actually Lilith and Samael's essence together that impregnated Eve. It's not only Samael. It's Samael and Lilith. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking Kabbalistic tree of life connections here too. I'm sure you've it's, thought about it. Definitely, that, right? of course, definitely. <laughs> and the serpent going up, right. you know, right. uh, it's, it's, it's very Kabbalistic. It, it speaks about a lot of the chakras and the energy inside the human body. That's right. And uh, when we speak about Lilith and Samael, uh, you know, Lilith, considering they're making her bad, look bad, but in a sense, it's kind of the ego, the uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the immaturity of man uh, or the selflessness of man represented in that scene. Now, Cain came along and then uh, Abe uh, through a conception between Adam and Eve. Now, as we know that uh, when they were doing right. the sacrifice, the sacrifice of Cain was not accepted right. and they only accepted the, the sacrifice of Abe. And this right. is where the first crime started. Now, the reason... A lot of people said, why wouldn't we accept the sacrifice of Cain and only Abel, although right. Cain was a good guy or whatever. Uh -huh. It goes back to that conception of Samael and Lilith coming together. Right. Now, in another thing, they also mentioned that when God asked for a sacrifice, he asked to give him, to give him what, is, what they love the most. Now, when Cain gave uh, his fruits, they weren't accepted. Abel uh, came with a calf and, you know, he, God loved the smell right. and everything. Right, but then right. Cain Neat. killed, yes. <laughs> but then Cain killed his brother. Right. Now, who did Cain love the most? What did Cain love the most? Some people suggest that it was his brother. So he uh, gave a sacrifice of what he loves the most. In interesting. I haven't heard his that brother. take before. Wow, yes. that's interesting. Wow. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, right. You know, the... And the yeah, more you I mean, dwell in it, the more you get lost. So th this is this is great stuff. I mean, 
And, and for some, you know, maybe more conservative Masons that don't get into this kind of stuff, this might seem like crazy talk or whatever. Um, but I think that, you know, Freemasonry is really all about the freedom of thought. That's right. And, and open-minded and, uh, you know, because, you know, a lot of it really got strengthened during the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, um, where, you know, people had been repressed and their thinking had been repressed um you know for a long time and people have been forced to think in a certain way or believe certain things and, and masonry really is against that masonry is all about freedom of thought freedom of exploration researching thinking for yourself coming up to your own conclusions so this is the kind of stuff that a good mason would do that's explore. right think about that's all right. the alternative explanations don't just accept things but rather question that's and right there's nothing bad about asking questions that's very true. And what does yeah. Freemasonry truly, what's the etymology of Freemasonry? I think Manly P. Hall puts it very, very well. Uh -huh. uh, it comes back from Freemason, which means the children of light. Right. Yeah, and I, I've heard that too. And in the Rosicrucians mentioned that too. And I wish I could get more information on that etymology. Where are they pulling this from? You know, and is it true? Because if it is, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. I think it's ancient Egyptian. I can uh, search. I think I, I did uh, a paper in, in Lebanon about it. I'll search for it and I'll, okay. send, I'll email oh, it I'll to you. I want to see the paper. Yeah, maybe yes. we could do another show uh, and we can go into detail on that. I'll do a little of research. Of course. You kind of refresh your research on that because I think a lot of Masons would be interested to, that, that could be a presentation in itself. Just, I, I did actually a presentation yeah. about the etymology of the word and the spell of words. And I'd love to give it on your channel someday. That'd be great. That'd be great because, um, yeah, I mean, because in Masonry, we always say we're, you know, we're in search of light as Masons um, and light being symbolic of wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I, I avoid knowledge because knowledge could just be memorized. Fast. That's right. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about putting things together, finding deeper meaning in our world, in our existence. Why are we here? Who are we? What are we supposed to do? How can I become better? You know, this is what masonry is about and so that's wisdom i would say that's right uh, very true i mean facts can lead you to wisdom when you get a lot of little data points and you put them all together and you get the aha moment that's, that's right awesome. that's the the exactly is masonry, is masonry. Yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. exactly so, i hate know, it when uh, some masons say that they're not esoteric or not into that. Uh -huh. masonry is all about that hidden knowledge that search of that that's it so, that's it i mean it made masonry is like um it's like solving a mystery. Like, you know, some people like to read mystery novels, you know, and, and you're, you're given clues and, and a lot of um, symbolic scaffolding. That's right. But you're never spoon fed the answers. That's anyway. right. But we have a lot of great people throughout the history of, of humanity who have created this scaffolding as imperfect as it is. And it's, it's morphed over time and new symbols have come in and others have left. But the thrust of it is still there for That's those who, you know, seek knowledge. Yes, um, sir. You know, so it, it, the, the temple can be rebuilt. That's true. Yeah. yeah the temple is just <laughs> right in front of our eyes, man. We, had, yeah. we don't have to live very far. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So um, let's see. Uh, how should we end this program? Let's see. Um, so I just wanted to, maybe if we yeah. could end on this point. Uh, sure. You know, that trinity that everybody speaks about, which existed throughout the ages, you know, between the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, mm -hmm. between uh, 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 Yahweh and uh, Adam bringing humanity, and uh, Isis, Osiris, and Horus, uh, you right. can also find it in Islam, in uh, Muhammad, Ali, his son-in-law, and Fatima, his daughter, and the wife of uh, Ali which is also a trinity. Wow. Uh, if you go dwell deep into Islam, you'll find that trinity that, that exists and still thrives until today, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and uh, that trinity can only be uh, approached and, um, and fathomed when you understand that that duality that we have on earth is nothing but, but one. That multiplicity brings unity. That's that right. positive and negative don't exist. There's only that that's unity, right. that uh, that yeah. one. Yeah. Well, that's why they say that the high priest walks up across the checkerboard floor. 
exactly the meaning of that concept you know exactly checkerboard floor is this concept of, of division and duality uh the multiplicity of things um and some can get lost in that and 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 not and what's it, Seth, the forest from the trees concept too comes into play yes right? it is. um and and in reality it's 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 a it's a it's a system it, it's a complex system all of reality right um, but yet there is a unity, there is a, a wholeness or um, um, a coherence to it all. And that's the oneness. And that's where it's all good. That's it makes sense. And it's perfect. just as perfect as it can be. But until you come to that vantage point, it's going to look really imperfect because you're, you're sitting here in this one little corner suffering. That's right. You know? That's very true. So, anyway, brother, this has been a, a great pleasure. I love you, man. Thank you yeah. so much for the opportunity, and I look forward to uh, future things together. Oh, and uh, honestly, great yeah. work. Keep it up. And uh, you know, uh, with all of this going on, uh, the winds of God's, you know, fix our sails, and you're one of these sails. So just keep going forward, keep doing what you're doing. You know, hey, God man, bless. brother. Thank you so much. That's kind of you, uh, but I also see you as one of those sails. So it, it's an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so love much. you, man. Of All course. Right, you. Take care. Cheers. You take care. Bye-bye.